George currently remains a partner emeritus, that's good, in the highly acclaimed San Francisco architectural firm EHDD. I think that stands for Esri Holmesy Davis and Dodge. Dodge and Davis, okay, the order is important. Um, I'm amazed I got that. And has served on several design juries, participated in lectures and conferences regarding uh, design, and he's a, been a consultant to the National Park Service in researching and establishing design guidelines for Yosemite National Park, and contributes to other public design and environmental projects. In 2006, he received the prestigious Maybach Award from the California Council of the American Institute of Architects. Sometime I'll have to tell you about my short-term residence in a Maybach home at Berkeley. <laughs> um, Donald Linden is Professor Emeritus of Architecture and Urban Design at UC Berkeley. He's also head of departments of architecture at MIT, the University of Chicago, uh, the University of Oregon. Linden's design work includes Sea Ranch Condominium One with MLTW, um, which received the 25-year award from the American Institute of Architects and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. He also chairs the TSR Commons Landscape Committee, uh, managing 10 miles of coastal forest landscape here. Among his publications is the Sea Ranch, which describes and analyzes TSR's landscape and distinctive architecture. A new expanded edition has recently been published. Richard Whitaker, Dick Whitaker, was a founding member of the California architecture firm Moore, Lyndon, Turnbull, Whitaker, and LTW which played a major role in the genesis of the Sea Ranch concept and design philosophies. In 1991, MLTW received the prestigious 25-year honor award from the American Institute of Architects for the Sea Ranch Condominium One development. Dick has extensive professional experience in the practice of architecture as well as architectural academics, including a serving as dean or head positions at several universities. In addition to participating in the design of several homes at the Sea Ranch, Dick served several years as the director of design for the Sea Ranch Association and was the primary author of the current edition of the Sea Ranch Design Manual Rules. And he still serves on the design committee. Uh, as you can imagine with their, I don't know, exactly 175 years or something like that of experience. Uh, this, this could be a long listing of serious creative achievement. But I think what we want to talk about today is their experience in particular here at the Sea Ranch. So uh, I'm going to go ahead at this point, make sure you know, Dick Whitaker is here to my immediate left. George Holmes, he's in the center. And Donald Linden is on my far left. And with that, I, I'm going to go ahead and proceed with this. I'm going to act a little bit as moderator here and ask the questions. Uh, each of these individuals uh, in their own right uh, uh, is a gifted speaker, so at some point I may, in order to keep us moving, <laughs> give a gentle sign, <laughs> a, a more explanatory or whatever, <laughs> and, uh, so that we could get through this, although I think that we're going to find all of it interesting and informative.
question that uh, I wanted to ask each of you to spend a few minutes on uh, is tell us how and why and when you got involved in the Sea Ranch project. I, I think sort of that story of whatever bit of happenstance or scheming got you here and involved you, I'd like to do. So go ahead. Dick, why don't you start? Uh, here's the mic. Let's well, see, we did uh, you know, much better than we go, but we used to do the you know, label. It gives you something to look at if you get tired of what you're saying. <laughs> but it will keep going around until it. If you notice it's kind of repeating, we can turn it off. And I do have some other things I want to show. Pardon me for not having this already. I haven't used my slide projector for about 12, 14 years. <laughs> First of all, I couldn't find it. And, um, now I'm sorry I did. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, the, the beginning of MLDW was, was one of those things that happens by uh, not totally chance uh, and not totally luck. And, uh, but the fact is, we were all at Berkeley. I was coming back from, uh, from being in the Navy for three and a half years, and, and uh, uh, the, the school to finish my architecture program. And uh, John was there and had come out to teach uh, in the program. Charles, did Charles get there first? Yes. Yeah. Charles Moore came and uh, ultimately became head of the, of the program there. <clears throat> and George, of course, was working in San Francisco with Joe Eschrick and uh, doing very accomplished buildings that caused us all to get excited and uh, follow in, uh, in their trace in, in the architecture world. Um, and we were doing other things at the time. Don was doing some projects with his father, who was an architect in Southern California. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Trendle uh, was working for Skid Moore's and Merrill. Uh, Don and I were teaching. Chuck was teaching. Uh, Chuck was doing work with uh, uh, Clark and Buehler in San Francisco as well as home work. And we were sharing a kind of a almost basement uh, space in a, an apartment, under an apartment building on Alcatraz Street in, uh, in Berkeley. Um, and we had a lot of fun together. And we, we kind of uh, got to the point that we were getting to be pretty close friends. And, uh, we shared a lot of interests in various kinds of things that we had been involved with, traveling and kind of uh, mine buildings and farm buildings and barns and kind of old buildings around, as well as thinking about architecture from a slightly different uh, way it was being thought of. I should mention, the 50s and 60s, for architecture in the Bay Area it was an unbelievable time to be there and practicing architecture and teaching architecture. It was just an incredibly stimulating time. People were coming back from the service. There had been the background of, of people like Worcester and Maybeck and Julia Morgan in the Bay Area. And uh, it just was all coming kind of up and where it had been lying so much format back during the war. And uh, it was just unbelievably exciting in that respect. Uh, in fact, the architects used to get together just not by any club or anything, but just for lunch all the time. Some people would come over from San Francisco, people would go from Berkeley over to the city, uh, whatever. And in fact, I got a very big shock about that when I ended up several years later in Chicago, 
Um, and uh, we had the architecture program there. And I, at one point, I went down to see the head of an architecture program to see if we had done that something in the school. And so I got to the secretary, and uh, <laughs> uh, she said, well, he's back in the corner now. There are about 45 people in the office. It was a small Chicago office. And um, so she said, well, I'm no, no, I can find my way back. So I'm walking back through the office, and as I'm walking back, people are covering up the work. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, what the hell is this? <laughs> because we were doing just the opposite in San Francisco, in, in the Bay Area. We were sharing things with one another. And, and I, I just couldn't believe this was going on. I mean, it was just a whole different world. It, it, people there, there were, there were two kind of major things that had happened in Chicago, architecture-wise. One was, was uh, Louis Sullivan, which was back before the turn of the century. And the other was Mies van der Rohe, which was just before the, or in the very beginning of the Second World War. But all of that came together. But it had a very kind of rigid effect on the architecture community there. It wasn't like the Bay Area. And uh, I set out to try to change that. At least we changed it in the school. But I never made a dent on the profession there because that was just the way they were working. Um, so how and I, I think it, it says something for the whole architectural community in the Bay Area. It was a community of people all sharing and willing to share ideas. So how did you get from that into the casino? Well, uh, I ended up being, uh, I, I, moved four different times after I left Berkeley. I was at different, four different schools and at the AIA as well. And then uh, we kept, we had a house up in the Berkeley Hills. Um, it burned down in the fire in 91 when we rebuilt it. Uh, and I'm so glad we kept that because if we hadn't kept that, we might have just stayed in Chicago because we liked Chicago. And we had a lot of friends there. But we were determined to come back. And uh, so, hey, hey, let me let me rest yeah, with you here. Me, yes. The question was, how did MLTW get involved in the Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. And, uh, <laughs> and, and there's a nice story about that, um, uh, which is that um, uh, Al Boki came to. It's all set up that Al Boki came to uh, interview us one day in the office, which by then had upgraded to a uh, little old. Um, uh, railroad station uh, that was uh, in Berkeley. Uh, and I still remember that interview very uh, much because uh, uh, Al came in and he looked at uh, all our stuff. We showed him all the things we had done. And we had um, uh, all the things we had done were easily shown uh, because it was a young firm at that point. Uh, maybe two years. Um, uh, and um, uh, it uh, consisted of, it, it was really, uh, we, none, we none of us would admit it, but it was led by Charles. <laughs> um, and uh, who had been um, uh, both Bill's and my um, thesis advisor and teacher and friend, a very close friend at, uh, uh, at um, Princeton, uh, where we also had all been exposed to Lou Kahn, who was the other background figure in all. But back to the story. Um, Al Boki was um, um, in the US with me, talked and um, uh, went through a bunch of stuff. And then he finally said, "Well, yeah, that's good." And uh, uh, he would uh, uh, he would get back to us. But uh, as he was going out the door, he turned around and at us. And uh, there was at that time a very well-known English, I mean, uh, um, New York architect that we all admire, named. Um, Edward Larry Barnes, who did um, uh, that wonderful school that goes down the hill in uh, Maine. I loved it. Anyway, as Al went out the door, he turned around with a sort of twinkle in his eye and said, Well, it's Barnes enough for me. <laughs> uh, and 
he obviously meant both of the barns, <laughs> the vernacular barn and the contemporary barn. Uh, but then Larry laid me and sort of wondered, actually, how we got on the list uh, uh, to be interviewed. And um, Larry explained later, um, he loved to explain, uh, that um, he had been on a jury for a Sunset uh, Home Awards program. Uh, and what happens in these juries is that you all go around and look at all this stuff and uh, you pick out things you like and then they tell who, how many people like each. But usually you get, um, I forgot what it's called, but you get a, a, a recall possibility. You get to bring one back. And uh, Larry said that um, uh, the house that actually Charles had done uh, called the um, Bonham Cabin, uh, which had a great, a, huge artist's window uh, and um, a screen porch and a stove and a little loft and a tiny little bathroom kitchen uh, with, I don't know, some incredibly small number of square feet with a tar paper roof um, and all built with um, uh, plywood and cheap and so on. But it had been, um, and Charles was always very good at uh, uh, getting um, good, you know, he had more to bear great photographer to do the work, even with this little shed. But Larry, Larry claimed that what happened is that nobody liked this except him. Uh, but then when it was time uh, for the final review, they let him bring it back in. Uh, and so it won not a big prize, but some inner award or something. And then uh, <laughs> Larry said the reason for that was, the reason he was attracted to it, uh, was that um, the photograph that Marty had taken was of a huge redwood tree and this little shack next to it. <laughs> and he wanted architects who would present their work that way. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's basically how we uh, wound up uh, in this uh, enterprise. <laughs> it sounded like it might be a lateral arabesque rather than a straightforward uh, they usually are. George, how did you uh, get involved? And let me ask you to pull the microphone for We're recording this as well as video on it, so if you make any mistakes, we'll be able to point them out of there. <laughs> um, well, first, let me, uh, I want to thank Lisa uh, for bringing me up here <laughs> because uh, I've been driving up and down the coast for a long time, and, uh, and I wasn't going to be up here for, for the committee, and uh, I said, look, I, I have problems because I need to come up carpooling with Dick and, and others, and uh, it's a little easier, but going up here is a little more daunting. I, I, can, I can do anything still, but I, so Lisa, I'll get you up here and I'll get you back. Oh, okay, no problem. Thank you, Lisa. <laughs> um, um, I don't know, I, I, uh, I'm try, trying to sum it up, you know, the, the last the up years of, of dedication and and love of this, of this area and all of that. And uh, um, I have a few notions and uh, I think will come out by a lot of questions. Um, but um, I want to say that um, I'm really pleased to, to be, to see this place uh, to be celebrated and, and, be, and, I'm, and I'm one of the true believers in the Sea Ranch concept. And I've always been, I've always been, uh, it's always been part of my life, I right? think, what the cultural things and, and philosophical stuff that, that you people believe in, and to see it operate as it does now, I think is really marvelous. And, uh, um, I'm, I'm a um, um, product of San Francisco. I was born in San Francisco, raised at school there, public schools. Uh, went in the Navy for a short time in the Middle West. Midwest as a Navy <laughs> Naval, as a V-5 uh, aviation cadet, and uh, uh, I went in the Navy before uh, seven, I was 17, so I didn't get drafted, but I was going in, so uh, went in and got out as a, as a young person, um, went to City College, went over to Berkeley uh, in architecture, and that's a lot, it's an interesting path, a lot of little things going on there, but I, I'm a Californian, um, I'm facing California and I just love, I love the environment here, um, and I'm not a, an apostle of 
talk about it, but I do it, I just do it part of my life. And uh, um, over in Berkeley, um, I worked for Vernon DeMars for a while. And then uh, um, I met Don Carter, who worked for Larry Halpern. Um, and Larry becomes a, a very important uh, influence in my early formative stuff. Um, and at some point, uh, I'm working in a job in, in Richmond, California, uh, for a Vernon called Easter Hill, and it goes down, and I, I sort of say, well, golly, what do I do next? Where can I go? And Gene Walton, who is the, the uh, um, biologist or whatever in my office, said, talk to Joe Isherick. He's an interesting guy, and I think, oh, and, uh, that would be wonderful. And then Joe had been published in the Architectural Record, uh, showing his work. And uh, uh, it was a very, a very beautiful uh, presentation of, of both urban and uh, mountain work and stuff like that. So I said, all right, I'll try. So I, I had a brief interview with Joe. And at some point, um, uh, I got a call saying, um, Joe's interested and would like you to come over and work. And that was basically in 1950, 51. Uh, Joe, so I, I started working for Joe and I just stayed there. And uh, I was like a sponge. I just absorbed what Joe was about. Uh, he was a quiet, um, quiet enough um, uh, guy from Pennsylvania uh, with strong feelings, didn't say a lot. But he he made he manifested his uh, his notions very clearly, and a lot of times it came out as sketches and discussions. Uh, but it was a it was something he transmitted without being uh, like you know like giving the word out. And uh, I felt very comfortable working with Joe. Um, also, I I became a member of the Sierra Club early on. Spent a lot of time going up to Dollar Summit. 15, 20 years going up there, um, being part of that group. We built a warming hut up there out of logs and stuff, uh, volunteers. Um, and a lot of those folks that just remind me of, well, they, 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 were, they made up the sort of uh, composition of what the sea ranches are like, I think, the, the belief system and all of that. And it was just something that was so easy. Um, Joe gets, because of um, working with Larry, um, I'm not sure how Joe was selected, but Joe was called to be part of the team. Uh, uh, Al Bolte and Larry were selected along with my friends here. Uh, we were pulled in together, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, the concept of the sea ranch starts. But it's not a, it's not a doctrine that's laid out. And Larry, Larry is a, he's a sort of, leading us across the, the wilderness for a while. And, uh, and out of it, I think, comes more or less where we are now. And, but this was a very early voice in environmental planning and design. Um, and um, so it became part of our, the rest of us, us acolytes, to interpret that and figure out what it meant as far as the built environment. And that's, as you know, a lot of them written and uh, presented by very articulate folks. And uh, um, so it's a wonderful path that brings you right up to here. And it's, uh, it's a way of life, I think, uh, to be amongst alike um, believers, true believers in the environment. And uh, as you travel around the world, I've been down to Patagonia not so long ago, and I feel the kinship of uh, being on that environment, on the edge of the continent and the ocean and all that, but it's down next to the Antarctic. And I just felt the connection all the way up to where we are. And uh, so there's something about this place. And driving up here with, today with Lisa, and as we left the urban area and we kept filtering it out, we, get, we finally get out to where you start to sense the Pacific coast, the edge of the world, and it's just fantastic. Uh, continues to be that way, and uh, I hope I can continue to do it as long as I can. But all things change, and so we want to make some things. We'll time. get to that thing about change in a while. <laughs> uh, but I, I uh, was going to ask you next uh, why and how you ended up spending these 50 years. But I'm 
think I'm going to ask it, ask a different question and say, when did you think or realize that this project might be something special? That that was more engaging, more satisfying, more challenging, rewarding, the things that sort of stir you professionally because you spent a lot of years, each and every one of you, and so it seems to me somewhere along the line, it, it must have moved out of a nice project into something special. And I, I would be interested in hearing when, when or how did that happen? I'm assuming it did. So you correct me. I've been here before. But anyway, why don't you, uh, George, why don't you start off on that? You were getting there. <laughs> well, you're warming up to the idea of the notion of how to express this, this thing that's hard to, to uh, express. Yeah. Um, um, it's, a, it, it's like um, this place embodies the environment. Um, and the concerns that one finds in the national park system. Uh, and they're very articulate about that. Um, and, you're, and you're working with people like him who feel the same way. And therefore, what you do, um, um, you can accomplish something by um, um, abiding by certain uh, attitudes towards the environment. And uh, I think I've always sort of had that notion and um, without saying, um, you, you tend to reflect on these things later on as the, as the clock starts to run on and people ask you about that. And uh, um, there, is, there is that about being associated with folks who, who have the same feeling about the environment, all the things that we're concerned about now, and, um, um, and how, how, you, how you fit in with that. Uh, um, that light gets turned on maybe in an instant or it's, it's subliminal. And, uh, and I think, I, 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 I sort of think I've always been that, that latter thing about um, being comfortable uh, here in the environment like this and yet having the, the uh, opportunity to still be part of our world. And, uh, and now the concern about how how, does, how do we go for the next step and still maintain that without destroying it? This is the thing that's very sort of troubling. And, uh, so this wasn't so much an, an epiphany as it was a kind of an outgrowth and a sense of opportunity that you will hear, maybe qualitatively different than what you might do. Because certainly the coast has other examples of people who respond to differently. Well, yeah, and you know, uh, professionally, working with Larry Halperin, understanding what Bill Worcester was talking about, and all and the landscape park. So I used to say some of my best friends were landscape architects. <laughs> now some of them are gone, and uh, I have other friends. <laughs> <laughs> so how about you, Tom? Well, the um, um, putting in, uh, answering a slightly different question. Um, uh, which is an epiphany I had only recently. Um, um, when I first thought this was something really important was when we started working on it, frankly. Uh, we, um, we saw it as a chance to embody a bunch of things that we were concerned about and interested in. And it pulled together um, some really important strands among the um, both of us in MSW. Um, and, um, uh, one of those strands was a uh, um, real interest in agricultural buildings. Uh, and in fact, in an article a couple years before uh, we got the job, um, I was closer to the mic and it started ringing um, uh, like that. <laughs> um, uh, before, but a couple years before we got the job, I wrote a, um, or we wrote an article, a manifesto, in, called Toward Making Places. Um, and we were, um, uh, one of the things we talked about is how important barns were because they had this big structure and that it actually was a structure that uh, wooden barns, unlike metal barns, went through aging. <laughs> uh, and they became a part of the environment. And that was something that really interested us. Um, and um, uh, David has
had similar experiences. Bill Turnbull came from a, an agricultural family. Actually, his uh, father also was an architect, but he was a gentleman farmer, in fact, is what he did. Um, and Bill always had roots in the, in the agricultural world uh, and was the one who spoke the most about architecture and the landscape. Um, and we learned the rest of us a lot from him about that. Um, uh, then, um, um, but what we were interested in was having a very disciplined kind of architecture that was one that had um, what I call a kind of graduated relationship between person and place. That is to say, it had spaces that were intimate, what we call the indicula, the four-post thing. It had then a larger box that would shelter against the environment. And then that had uh, uh, bays and uh, uh, projections and things, uh, uh, porches that uh, reached out and became in intermediate between the larger environment. And then those became clusters, and those clusters then uh, we had an original name. When we, when we were working on the condominium the first time around, uh, we actually were asked to develop a, a plan for not 10, but for 80. Um, and uh, we did that, and uh, um, actually at some point we'll turn on another projector there and uh, see what that was. Um, uh, but the whole idea of that was that it would be, uh, we would do 10 to start with, and then there would be eight clusters of those. So it was all about clustering multiple things together to make another space beyond the building itself. So it was right away about buildings and spaces and uh, defined spaces between. Uh, uh, and then those were all related very sharply to the country. So that, to us, was really fascinating, and we saw it as being beyond what conventional practice was doing at that point. Uh, we were all um, disappointed with where international modernism was going at that point, uh, and um, uh, were anxious to find roots in the place itself uh, that could um, give us a different way of working. Uh, so uh, that was the real initial fascination, and it was actually the original condominium was meant to be. Well, Oceanic was quite clear about the fact that the condominium and the hedgerow houses and the store, which were all commissioned at the same time and built all at the same time uh, uh, by Matt Sylvia, they were quite clear that their charge was not just to make a thing, not just to make a condominium but to actually explore a way of building that was unique to this place. Uh, and it would be a way of showing what the potential of having architecture in this place was. Uh, and that was one of the reasons they had the condominium, they had the houses, the, the hedgerow houses, and so on, and the store. Um, all that said, that was, uh, gave us a real sense of portent, okay? Um, but the epiphany came maybe 30 years later. Do you remember, um, um, do you remember the Bill Clinton um, uh, phrase about it's the economy, stupid? Well, it came to me about uh, uh, 20 years ago. It's the air, stupid. <laughs> it was this place with the quality of being on the edge of the ocean and having the clarity of the air and the cleanness of the all that, which is only to say, to modify our interest in what we could do architecturally and the opportunity it presented. At, at some point I realized that beyond that it was really the environment itself that we were working in, which is what it was about. It sounds like uh, even though every business or occupation has its own jargon, its own very efficient language, that you guys took some old words and gave them new meaning and wrapped them up in these concepts so you could actually talk to each other mm -hmm. in an easy way that you all understood, you know, the vocabulary was there. Dick, you were trying to tell me I said something just incomprehensible. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I did that. <laughs> Go ahead, Dick. I want to hear how you, you know, did it. it where it's you really interesting because uh, I think back about, you know, our first
first place of business when we were all together. And we weren't in business then, we were just friends all doing things, but critting one another all the time. And we got into that habit. And I think that, uh, I don't know, was it Bill that said uh, our firm is uh, MLTW and four architects sitting around a table with one pencil. <laughs> and and it, it often was like that. I mean, we rarely did things alone. We worked on all the projects together instead of, you know, you do that project, you do that project kind of thing. I think the, the other thing that seems to me that is a major aspect of all this is that, and it comes back from a wonderful little book called Kindergarten Chats by Lewis Sullivan. It was written before the turn of the century, back in the 1800s. And he said in that book, he had a lot of great, wonderful things in it, but the thing that I think stuck with me, he talked about the idea that a building, a piece of architecture is, a, is an act, not an object. And I think Don mentioned that we were kind of, you know, fighting against the whole European modernism, and, and even though I mean, it was impressive and compelling, but the fact is, it never seemed to be an act. It was more, it was published as an object. And somehow, through the work that we did before we got involved with the Sea Ranch, Charles Moore, Charles Moore House is a particularly good example of that. I mean, the idea of having an idicula kind of space which is a space inside of another space, or it comes from the, the little place on the front of a church where the has a partial enclosure to hold the bishop or the whatever, saint or whatever. But it's the same thing that happens in the condo. Inside the units, there's a four poster, as we used to call it, that's carrying a roof, of course, uh, as it turns out, that happens to be a sleeping loft in many cases. And we got involved with that kind of an idea. And we got involved with it particularly during a lot of the early work, the bottom cabin particularly that, that Chuck refers to, uh, is uh, an amazing little piece of stuff uh, in this big redwood forest. It's tiny. In fact, I have some pictures that I will show to you in a while, but, but uh, uh, it's just re that's remarkable. And there were several other buildings, the Johnson Cabin, which had again a lot of the same kind of character about it. And a lot of the work we were doing previous to the Sea Ranch was somehow, although we didn't know it at the time, was building toward this thing. And the fact that it came along at the right time and we were ready <laughs> to get involved with it. And it, it, you know, we didn't get involved with it because we were out searching for it as an idea. I mean, as a place to do work or a, somebody that happened. It happened a lot because of the university. And his previous involvement, both at the university and also through a project we did in Portland, uh, which was a fountain, and we did a kind of a huge uh, wood uh, kind of uh, gathering place up in the back of it as, as an element that was an entry to the whole fountain area. Uh, and uh, we worked with him very closely on that. And so all these things were working together to kind of pull us into this project when it happened. Uh, I remember particularly well, it was the first time our first child was out in, out of the house or whatever. We had a picnic up on the condo site. And there were Don and Alice and my wife, Sue, and my first son, Rich, and, uh, and Bill. Uh, uh, am I missing someone? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, but anyway, we're sitting out there, and I remember we were 
we're talking about, you know, this unbelievable sight sitting on the edge of, you know, the western United States. And it's 10 miles long. And we're there in the middle of this place. And at one point, we, I remember a conversation we had a little bit about it. We kind of thought, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't be doing anything here. Um, that quickly passed. <laughs> but it was the beginning of, of something that I, I think it stimulated all of us to the point that we never got back, you know, beyond that one in terms of history. And it is, I, I think the, the condominium and then the other buildings that we were involved with here, the, the, uh, the first and uh, second swimming complexes, and uh, the first one primarily. Uh, and uh, it, it just, I, it's never been, I know it's never been out of my feeling and my blood somehow since that, and it's one of the reasons I'm back here, and I have been participating in various aspects of it in time, uh, is because it's just, it is such an incredible place to be, and uh, I, don't, I don't see how anybody wants to get to it could possibly kind of move away from it, uh, in that sense. Uh, yeah, George, go ahead. Uh, turn, Larry, turn your Larry, mic. Larry drives, by the way. Okay. Another word. Turn your mic on. Uh, I turned it on because of the screen. Yeah, you push the little button. Okay. Yeah, I'm just going to say that the Bay Area is a very special place. I just want to, uh, all this is stimulating me, and I'm, I'm starting to coalesce into more or less the things that I think uh, affected me. All this, and uh, um, I, I just want to say, working for a man like Joe Eschrick, who you may or may not know much about, uh, uh, who approached uh, design uh, on specific issues like a house with a client, would always approach it with an open, open page uh, and a series of interviews to understand what it is the client wanted, their goals were, and uh, and little by little. After uh, a succession of meetings, outlook started to emerge. The pattern of living, uh, as it's defined uh, uh, ge geometrically and architecturally, um, and that skill, um, I think, is very important. And I, I, um, I wasn't privy to it all the time, but I knew it was happening, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so it was part of the thing. That, and so um, I think what that posed for me, as as I more or less graduated through the ranks of working in a place like that, was that uh, given my, my predilection for the environment and landscape and, and love for it, um, to um, help interpret how um, uh, people, families, individuals could live in this kind of environment and still respect the, the notions of, uh, um, of uh, preservation ecological issues, etc. And, um, and I think that's more or less what happened when, when Larry started his work here on this, this wonderful stretch. And uh, um, the notion of, of doing something here that respected what was here, allowing it to continue forward, but uh, allowing the people who come here to enjoy it. And, um, and in a sense, I, I think that's what I love about coming up here, because this place it, I, I love being out here, all the business about being on the edge of the ocean, um, the land forms and all that is very stimulating. I love being here. And uh, so to be part of a, of a, of a uh, architectural movement or construction that tries to install facilities for, life, for, for people to come here and enjoy it and not destroy it, but modify it, it's not going to be the same, but to keep it is what I think um, becomes intriguing for me, and, 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 and I guess important. It sounds like uh, in the background, I, I heard the uh, names of Al Volke and Larry Halpern, and it sounds like uh, uh, 
they were both kind of informative about presenting how you might look at this uh, opportunity or project. And, and uh, I'm not quite sure how to ask the question, but I, I, would, I think maybe it would be good to hear a few words about these two guys who seem to have, uh, one of them sort of created, uh, in a sense, the project and pulled the team together, and the other one who brought maybe uh, the, the landscape element in to aid your own sort of existing interest in environment and maybe relating architecture and environments a little differently or a little more completely. So I can see maybe why the barn resonates. You know, farmers uh, think about where they put the barn and the way the wind blows and how to use the hillside. Uh, so I, maybe uh, I'd just ask you if you have any reflections about the impact of these two guys. Well, it was enormous um, and remains so. Um, and um, the, the contributions are not quite so easily separated. Uh, they had worked together before in uh, uh, Hawaii. Um, and um, uh, Al uh, has um, been a very, very interesting um, um, oral history of Al Boki and the uh, uh, California Digital Library. Um, and of course, Larry's written quite a bit. Um, uh, and also has had films and things. And also there's Anna, we shouldn't forget, who was actually part of the mix, too. Um, and her interests in their relationship to him uh, as someone who was interested not only in ecology, but he, you know, as I've said before, he called his initial sketches for the sort of the initial plans that he did a score. And the score was a score, not a plan. And the score was a statement of the intentions and a musician's score lays out the whole structure, but the musicians interpret it. Uh, and Larry did this uh, score as part of what was developing as a whole team. The, the team was assembled. I don't know exactly how many people it was, but a dozen at least. Um, and uh, he had a, a geographer um, uh, in his, uh, on his staff. There were other people from the staff working on it. Um, then there was um, the uh, civil engineering firm that did all the um, infrastructure. Uh, and um, uh, then the Joe's um, involvement and our involvement, uh, which, I, which I have to say, it was actually it was Charles and Bill who attended most of those uh, uh, sessions, um, uh, Charles being the, the senior member. Uh, uh, and Bill be, being the one of us who was actually full-time eventually when we got this job. He came away from SOM and became full-time in the office. We were still teaching at that, or more, <laughs> or less, more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um, so it was, a, it was a team, and it was run as a team. Um, that is to say, we, they met every, um, I'm not sure, a couple of weeks and um, uh, had these long working sessions where everybody's contribution was uh, taken into account. Um, and uh, some of you have attended Larry Hoffman workshops, uh, and you probably understand that they are, in fact, open, they are inviting ideas, they're bringing everything, but it's also that he has a pretty good idea what he wants to come up with. <laughs> uh, and that uh, he sets it up so that there are real contributions from all sorts of people, but he is, he is guiding. And then Al was there also in these meetings, and not a son of partner. <laughs> uh, no, um, but I, I, I should say one more thing about Al, is that it's important to realize, and I actually didn't fully realize until I read this oral history, uh, what an incredible amount of background work Al was doing to make this thing happen. I mean, there were consultants, we're a, a real estate consultant and a PR consultant who was brilliant. Uh, uh, and, um, but 
he was he was around lobbying and talking to the uh, council people and making it, and they actually he he said it wasn't common day law in Sonoma County when uh, when our building was done or was being done. And one of the other really important consultants was Reverend Johnson, who was a young staff member uh, from a big uh, uh, legal firm. Larry, uh, according to Reverend, he told us that he actually wrote condominium law for Sonoma County uh, because he, you know, he offered to do that. Um, and condominium was an unusual concept. We had worked on one before in in. Uh, Coronado, which unfortunately didn't get built. Uh, but um, that was part of our qualification. We've done a kind of anymore, we nobody had. Uh, but, um, uh, but he was a very innovative businessman. And one of the amusements, one of the things that really drove that home to me is that when I was looking for the oral history in the index, I couldn't find it. And it's because I wasn't looking in the business section. <laughs> And, and he, was, he was out there putting processes together and um, uh, actually making inventive business decisions as well as encouraging and, and knowing like because he was trained as an architect. He, he knew what we were dealing with and, uh, and he, was, uh, he was understanding what we were trying to do. He was encouraging us and pushing us uh, and meanwhile being around sort of uh, setting up the conditions. He also said in that um, in that um, oral biography, oral history, that what got him started uh, was that as a young man he had uh, gone to Sweden to see the new towns in Sweden, which were all the rage at that point, and it had made him realize that there was, which he hadn't previously thought about, that there was an opportunity to be an architect and affect more than an individual building. Uh, and so he went to work for uh, Neutra and Alexander, the Alexander Park, which was doing development. Uh, and then after a while, went with uh, Oceanic as their uh, vice president. Um, I, I, I read that page, actually, about his getting all this from Newtown to Sweden. Um, as I was going, just before I went down to breakfast in a Swedish hotel to talk to the head of the program I was teaching for, who had brought me a magazine. And the magazine was this, the Finnish equivalent of um, of well, uh, and it um, had in it twelve or no, twenty places you had to really see if you wanted to understand sustainable architecture. And the third one was the Sea Ranch Town. Mm -hmm. <laughs> George, do you want to say something about those two gentlemen? And the the the. The uh, circulated around Larry and um, um, I, I I traveled once uh, with my wife in the Middle East. When we went to Israel, um, and we met um, um, a gentleman whose son worked in, in Larry's office, and he, he toured us through uh, Israel and Jordan. Um, we stayed at the books once, um, and it was very intriguing. Uh, I really didn't know. Uh, I'm a traveler. Uh, but I didn't know what was really happening there from the standpoint of what was being developed on the land. Um, later on, um, Larry uh, gets involved with, uh, I guess, uh, Bill Worcester on, in, in Berkeley on Greenwood Commons. Mm -hmm. And uh, they develop, out of it comes the idea that you may know about of, of, um, of houses on dedicated parcels surrounding a place called the Commons. And that's Greenwood Commons. Uh, when you read the, the archivist, the lady of Berkeley, uh, 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 way more low. Way more low presentation, all of a sudden I, I see, all of a sudden this comes out very clearly. We start working on the Sea Ranch here, and um, um, the, the ideas and sketches are of um, concentration of the habitation and then the open spaces, commons, which everybody has a stake in. Um, so, golly, yeah. what's coming, you know, some are coming together. Um, I'm living, I'm working, uh, my wife and I buy a, um, 
25, a 50 foot lot in San Francisco up on, um, above, uh, on 20 Benoit on top of Mission Dolores. And uh, my good friend Don Carter wants to build a house also. Uh, he, he's a partner in Larry Halpern's office. Uh, we split the lot and develop uh, two houses on it which share the entranceway without any legal binding thing, but we share the entranceway. And I guess that's a commons. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess it was a good decision, but things are changing, but our house is open to that with pro property lines and our entry commons, we walk up sort of separate ways. Uh, there's a property line there, but we don't know where it is. If someone buys Don's house, and is not good friends with me, I'm going to be living in that situation where we share this, which is a commons. Uh, so I guess I was sort of brought up uh, at that particular point in my life about living uh, in, in a situation which is like what we have here, except it's more complicated. It's a commons because of uh, Don Carter and Larry Halpin. So um, it's an interesting, you know, to reflect upon it now at this, at this time. Um, the, the sort of commitment that we have to do that, Don and I never even thought about the issues in the future or what it might be. We were, we were good friends, we were professionals, we enjoyed, we went to the mountains, we did all these wonderful things, uh, etc. And uh, the future is the future. Um, but right now, let's, let's enjoy this, this image of coming into a, a compound that we, we shared when we were in Greece and you came up into uh, complex of buildings into an entrance court and the houses were there, and their entrance were there. And uh, so that's that's sort of this little connection with me with what's going on up here. And, uh, were, were you guys uh, consciously aware of the impact of commons, the riparian corridors and the meadows and how that allowed the sort of fluid movement and existence of wildlife that somehow sooner or later becomes a, a kind of an element we all enjoy living here. It, 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 I'm curious, was it consciously an awareness at that time or something that evolved? Uh, I, I think it was here. Uh, we accepted it, we enjoyed it, we thought it would go on forever. and. Um, there was never any question about curtailing it or quartering it or documenting it, but it was part of the life that existed here, and that's the reason we came up here. And to, to help it survive is another issue, and, uh, because our being here starts to compromise that. Yes, but it also allowed it to continue in a, in a different way, and it turns out to be a very prevalent value amongst the folks. You can see more wildlife on the sea ranch and on a weekend than you sometimes would see in a trip to the Rocky Mountains, which is kind of sad. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at the time, and I need to do a little check here. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one more question that I really want to get to. Um, there were, Don, you said you had, and I've been seeing the slide going, and they were going there. Did, was there something that you wanted to say about that? Uh, uh, they were up there with images of the economy and, okay. and what so, I, I think because I had talked about them, I hope that I said it clearly enough that it could be clear. So we saw the scores and... and uh, okay. Yeah, you saw the score and you saw the, um, uh, the 80 unit uh, condominium uh, plan. And so that is a point. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't want to, I didn't want to illustrate, I didn't want to talk about them. I just thought if I talked about them and then they were up there, you could see them. Yeah. Um, Are you going to show them? Any? Yeah, I'm just talking. Is he coming? Who's Aaron? There you go. Oh, now he's talking about it. While he's doing that, uh, I'll go on. Uh, we're, we're sort of over the time, but uh, I, I would like to, to uh, cover one more question. Uh, I, I skipped over a bit the how and why you were here these 50 years, but I think we can tell you, you've been engaged from the get-go and found ways to stay that way. Uh, I have a, a, a question that is, I, I don't know quite how to ask, so if it comes
comes out clumsy, my apology, but I'm thinking about the 50 years that or so that have elapsed and that you folks have found ways to be part of and, and participate in and stay engaged with. Uh, there were lots of changes that came along. Uh, whether, whether we're talking the, you know, the main bill or we're talking just the demographics that evolved. Uh, well, there are going to be, in the next 50 years, inevitably change. We kind of know that in general about it. Specifically, it could be climate change effects or legislative health or effects. <laughs> uh, maybe just changes in how people live and work and play. Uh, so and TSR is going to inevitably respond to these uh, evolving kinds of demands and opportunities. My, my question for you uh, folks is, what would you want to see if you could come back 50 years from now at the next celebration that, I don't know, don't think most of us will expect to be here then. Uh, but if, if you could, what would you want to see then that would make you feel that this is, this is still essentially the sea branch. Uh, change and evolve, but still in some manner quintessentially the sea branch. And maybe put it the other way around if it helps. If what if missing in that future sea branch would leave you with the feeling that this was no longer the TSR, the sea branch that you worked on and enjoyed bringing to this stage. So either way of looking at it, but I, I think it's a, an interesting question that, that's going to preoccupy us here for some time. You told us you were going to ask that question or you announced it to the uh, uh, info alert. <laughs> Um, and um, I did write down a few sentences um, uh, to it posed in the way of what would you want to see looking back after 60 years or 50 years. Uh, and um, I, I'm not, I'm not going to, your questions about what changes might happen and so on is, is, is interesting and I can talk about that, but that's not. No, I really want to. I really want to get at what you know. Uh, what, what I and I'm also not going to talk about what would disappoint me. I've done enough of that in the past. Okay. Um, what I'm going to say is very simple stuff. But looking back after 50 years, what will make it be a success would be successful caring for the place. That means caring for the land and the special structure of the landscape here the hedgerows, the meadows, the forest and forest run, the riparian areas, and landmark clusters of vegetation buildings. Caring to make buildings that take their place in this land and the landscape with ease, imagination, and respect. A place that is energy independent, extraordinarily wise in the uses of water, and sustains many kinds of life and lifestyle. A place that is available to very many kinds of people and is more intensively used than it is now when so many of the structures are empty so much of the time, which is essentially a waste. A place that has valuable places of gathering with coffee, conversation, <laughs> and displays of information that can be sought especially ones proximate to TSRA offices, where members and visitors and docents and staff can mingle easily and come to know one another while they find ways to help care for the place, and revel in images and descriptions of what TSR is and can be, 
all made visible on large electronic screens fully connected to the web. <laughs> place that is where people will be able to create joyfully, share their concerns with others frequently, and be able to care for their health throughout their life. slides has to do with the fact that things that all of us, I think, were, were really excited about before we even got involved with, with coming together. Uh, and I think as we came together, we got more excited about some of these kinds of things. The traditional buildings that were very, very simple, straightforward, and yet had an incredible charm about them. Uh, and they weren't as simple as one is led to believe. There was a lot of things going on inside of these shapes that uh, made them quite wonderful. Um, old barns, for instance, and particularly the way they were made, uh, which is very much part of a lot of the architecture we have been involved in. Um, and the very way you put openings and windows and doors and things into a building. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, how you put people and fit people into spaces. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, like, what is the, what is the best way to get from point A to point B in space? <laughs> Uh, there obviously are an infinite number of ways to do that. And one of the things I think is wrong with, stop this, I don't want to put a lot of money in there anymore. Yeah, thank you. Uh, oh, this thing doesn't reverse, sorry. Uh, the, the whole idea of how you move through a space becomes critically important. And the way you handle openings becomes critically important. And it was that thing that, that uh, the business that a building is an act, not an object, begins to pose these kinds of questions. Uh, 
uh, being inside uh, can mean a lot of different kinds of things. I want to show you a house that was done by Dmitry Davinsky uh, back in 1972 here on the Sea Ranch. Um, I own the lot next door to this and was going to build a house on it and we were going to share a separate building that was between the two as kind of an overflow and we had more people than one would handle. Unfortunately, and for a lot of reasons, unfortunately, Dimitri died quite a few years ago now, and uh, I realized that I could not possibly build a house that was better than this one. And because it satisfies all that business that Sullivan was talking about when he was talking about the idea that a building is an act. And this house is pretty straightforward on the outside. It's very simple. It isn't screaming and yelling at you. Uh, it's sitting very, very kind of demurely in this forest. But you go in that door, and it is amazing. Because first of all, the redwood trees outside this house become the walls, visually. Um, last night, or early this morning, at about 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock when I woke up, I got up out of bed, go to the bathroom, I came out into the hallway, and it's not much of a hallway, it's about 4 feet wide and long, uh, and my God, it was just like 4th of July, it was gangbusters, there were these spots of lights all over the place, on the walls, the floor, out in the forest, and the bits of things, it was a moon. <laughs> which was just absolutely unbelievable. And anyway, but you, so you have this, this whole sense of a room is about 16 feet square, roughly. But it, then it relates to another space when you turn back. The front door is off there to the right. There's a loft up above. There's a sign that says kids only. And that my grandkids put up. Uh, there is a little Japanese you know, special tokenoma room, which are two Japanese masks that are real. They're about six inches thick. And then when you pull up the screen, you get another space on beyond that, uh, which can be a small office or a work room or another bedroom. Um, and when you get in that bedroom, you can look back into the living room or look out to the trees again directly from that room. If you turn the other way, uh, you run into the kitchen on the other side of the house, um, which is a tall space, as the whole building is, even though it's very small. Uh, and there's two large skylights that, in fact, heat this place up to the degree during most of the year that I don't have to have a heat on. Uh, when I, so when I get up here at Friday afternoon or whatever, it's warm inside. It's not warm, it's not cold. It's quite amazing. And not only that, the whoops, you know, <laughs> that one. Uh, this is looking on the side. There's a deck down on one side, uh, an upside down slide uh, showing a bunch, another deck. Uh, well, it's the same deck, it's just a different picture of it. And then around, well, it wasn't, that's it. Uh, the, it has a bathroom with a shower that was about nine feet square. Uh, it had a soaking tub in the shower uh, and a full glass sliding door uh, on one wall of the shower. Uh, and no curtains on it or anything. Uh, there's another house that saw so many places, but you don't worry about it because there's a lot of trees in the water. But anyway, these are the kinds of things that I think caused us to think about the sea range in a way that was different than one might think about a normal building project. And my God, what an exciting thing to be involved with. Thank you. George, you get the last word. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank Donlin for his presentation because it encompasses all the things that, that I, I think we all 
all share and, and are buzzing, buzzing around uh, right now. Um, my, I, I don't know how to, how to put this. Um, um, I'm like, I'm, I'm just a, another person on this planet, uh, trying to uh, survive and be uh, and enjoy it while we are here. And, uh, and but currently, um, the things that are happening that are going around are very discouraging. And uh, um, and so I, I don't know. I, I I've traveled and I've seen uh, other civilizations that are prospered and and go on their span and what's left. <coughs> um, and so here at the Sea Ranch, we have a wonderful place. Um, and I, how we survive and present this and conserve it for the future, et cetera, et cetera, I think is a real challenge. And uh, um, I don't know if there's uh, an answer. Um, there are wiser folks than I who could, who could talk about such a thing. But I'm really concerned. And uh, I, I sort of see what's happening is that it's not going to be the same. Um, I hope that the things that survive are, are the things that are still inspire people. And, um, but I can't say that for certain. And uh, I think the enjoyment of this place means that you give up something of your own, of your own so that it works for the common good. And um, if we're going to, if we're going to, Sup, if we're going to talk and argue about views and things like that, which are seem inalienable rights to where, where you are and you must have them, um, I think some of that stuff can be pretty destructive. And so um, I, I, uh, I don't know what to say. I, I think we have to be, uh, uh, we have to listen to each other, um, try to work out the compromises that will, in the end, serve some some common uh, thread of, of what this place is about. But it's not going to be easy. And uh, um, I, I, um, it's going to take, it's going to be hard work. Sounds like it's been hard work right along the way. But uh, anyway, Dick? One of the things, picking up on that, the chart I will add, agree with you totally. Is really, is really scary sometimes when you start looking around our country. I, I subscribe to the New York Times, and I, many, many times during this last year, I have thought about canceling it because it, it's not a happy experience reading some of the stuff that goes on in our country these days. And, and I was shocked in February when I saw a list of homes for sale at the Sea Ranch. There were five houses for sale for $3 million. And no, I don't know, that may be, be normal for everybody else, but, but uh, I feel I'm a little overwhelmed by that. Uh, and a couple of houses were like $3,600,000. Um, given the fact that, that you could buy a Bluff front lot for thirty-five thousand dollars back in 1965. Uh, now you have to escalate that up to where we are today. But uh, that, to me, is part of what George is, I think, speaking to. Is the fact there's a lot of changes happening in our world right now, and this place is so special and needs to be preserved somehow, so people can learn from it, if nothing else. But the joy of being here is just not like being in other places. It's, it's just, I don't know another place to live that, that or be part of that can, you know, substitute for the sea range. Uh, there are just so many things about it in terms of its sense of, of place, it's the relationship with people and nature and all of the things that go with that is phenomenal. And I, I don't know another place at the scale of this that, that you can possibly find. You can do it individually, I suppose, but that isn't social. 
Thank you, folks. Uh, it's, it's been interesting trying to tease out the kind of chemistry of the, the project, the professional qualities, the growth, the, the enjoyment, the challenge, uh, the orchestration uh, voluntarily of all of these uh, strong and interesting and able people to bring us to a point like this. I, I think if I heard them, the takeaway is there, there's a sort of an uncertainty about 50 years from now, but it'll be as good as the stewardship we exercise today and tomorrow and how much we take to heart. So with that, I'd like to thank these folks and give them a real hand for sharing such <laughs> challenges in the past. I know that the initial thinking about the place uh, fell somewhat prey to uh, economics and development and, you know, thinking about money and that kind of thing. Um, and then, of course, there was the whole uh, Bainville uh, Coastal Commission controversy, and both of those things, in fact, did have a very big effect on the Sea Ranch. Frankly, I don't see anything that big facing us. Um, we have other things that will face us, I'm sure. Um, but the biggest thing I see is the um, uh, the 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 uh, uh, a, to develop a mechanism for uh, passing on these values to future generations. You guys are all, forgive me, pretty old. Um, and, you, you know, I think, I, I mean, I, I'm, I am hopeful when I see uh, new sea ranchers come, some of whom were taken, brought here by their parents when they were young. And so obviously, in that sense, I think the buyers, this new crop of, crop, crop of buyers we're getting is maybe in a better place than we were getting 20 years ago. Um, but how do we preserve the values that, and pass on the values, because they're so specific to this place. And when I listen to you guys talk, it's very inspiring. Um, but I don't think people are gonna be going back and you know, listening to old tapes and that kind of thing. I think we need some mechanism, and I guess my question is, what might that be? The question is, what might the mechanism be that allows us to pass on vision and values to new members as they arrive, and some of us older ones move on? Which one of them can the first? <laughs> I think, I think this is a very, very critical thing. Uh, 
uh, actually right now in, in our culture. Uh, things that are going on around. Oh, is that on now? Yeah. This okay. It it. Uh, I mean, there's such a change. I mean, when you think of the whole way of communicating that we have now. Uh, I mean, I'm amazed going into a restaurant and sitting for lunch with my son that I do once a week most of the lives at home. And to see four people come in and sit down at a table, they all pull their iPhones out and put them on the table. And half the time, at least two of them are talking on their iPhones. Now, you've heard this, you know, a hundred times. Uh, it's not news. But the fact is, it's changing the way we communicate. And it's changing the way we think about things. And maybe we need to get an app for, for the students. <laughs> I don't know. We're getting one. We're getting one. We're getting one. We will be getting the 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 demo talking to the mic. We can't hear you. There is, in fact, now um, uh, some of you have heard about a, a proposal for uh, an app which would be a um, uh, a guide to the sea ranch, um, which will start with. Um, uh, my uh, audio walking tour, uh, and then we'll have added to that um, lots of archival material, and we'll have some, uh, each of the public access trails described in the same way that the, uh, uh, the walking tour of the first part is. Um, uh, this is, uh, we're seeking funds for it now. Um, some of you have received letters, and uh, uh, this will, um, um, begin work uh, in another month uh, uh, by Kevin Kine, who is the executive director of the Charles Moore Foundation. Charles, we have not spoken of enough uh, in this today, um, but, uh, uh, and then he and I will edit this thing. Uh, uh, and it will be something which can continue to, the great thing about it, as opposed to the great thing about my audio walking tour, uh, <laughs> is that this will be able to have uh, continuing updating and adjusting and adding more um, archival information in the way that when things can. Uh, and it will be an app that you can buy uh, for some modest amount of money uh, and, um, and you can then use to uh, access all that information. Yeah. That's terrific. I think so. Can <laughs> <laughs> I get uh, a moment? Can I? Yes. Can I you? Are you here? Yeah. Um, uh, I would say all is not lost. Um, <laughs> good. Um, uh, uh, the things that inspire me are, are sort of everyday things like uh, um, uh, paying attention to what's going on with uh, the organization like Patagonia uh, down in, in Chile, um, uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, listening to be part of the of various environmental movements, Sierra Club, but also being part, partake in it and be available to, to make direct contact with people who do that, and especially the young, young folks. Um, the Sierra Club, the outings, all those things I think are the things that let the word out. And those are the things that I find are really helpful. And, uh, um, um, you know, within my close circle of family and friends, and uh, my daughter's involved in uh, 2041, the group that goes down to Antarctica and uh, it recruits young, young uh, executive types to understand what's going on down there in terms of the year 2041 when the um, environmental controls expire and uh, to, show, to show them what Antarctica is about and to let them be like disciples going back and spreading the word so it can, so it can, so it can be perpetuated so you won't lose so, so the, the countries that are there won't exploit the natural resources. Uh, the sea ranch is a natural resource here. And so um, th there is that. I think young, the young folks are, are the ones, are the, the help, the, the future, <coughs> etc. And you should be available to, to bring them in to your circle, to let them know about it and be part of that. And, to, and not to, to isolate and insulate yourself here to reach out and uh, 
spread the word. Um, I think that's more or less where I sort of think it's going to happen. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll aim this at Donlin, but for all. Uh, Donlin, when you had the group of architects here as part of the 50th anniversary, they suggested things that might carry Sea Ranch forward. I remember one of them was uh, maybe a net new set of demonstration homes yes. or the, the buildings that are sort of in half ruined and verdant view being redeveloped into something. Is any of that going any place? Well, uh, complicated question. Uh, the, um, uh, we hope so. <laughs> there isn't at the moment. Um, but um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the notion of some kind of a program of, uh, um, of trying to find funds to sponsor some kind of uh, uh, projects that would be illustrative of new possibilities within the uh, general pattern of uh, paying attention to it. Um, I still personally hope that's going to happen, but I can't say there's any progress on it at the moment. Uh, we are planning, um, we had planned to uh, uh, have a follow-up workshop uh, and talk about all those things more, uh, and that, uh, that has for a variety of reasons not come to pass. Uh, but um, uh, I hope it still will, uh, and that the agenda from that and from that workshop that we did hold in, in March, which you did a, a, a video of, um, I hope that will um, um, generate some, um, some proactive things, which is really what you're asking, uh, are taking action. And one of the things actually um, we're just now proposing uh, within the Common Landscape Committee summary report, which we are about to submit, uh, which is a, a, a summation of what we've learned from five years of working on Common Landscape. Uh, we will have actually in that a suggestion that there are, um, oh, I think it's five or six um, projects that the association really ought to find a way of taking on as design projects. Uh, that actually are a way of, um, of taking what we have and showing how to use it best and showing how to make alterations if they're necessary and showing what the potential is in another way. Uh, but that's a big, it's a big item. But the, the fundamental thing is, yes, we need some form of proactive pushing for and uh, articulating and demonstrating uh, the possibility <coughs> of this place again. So thanks for the question. <laughs> uh, <coughs> you, 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 you had asked a question about the next 50 years, and there was a lot of discussion about how to preserve what there is that's wonderful about Sea Ranch. Donlin made a couple of suggestions and ways to improve it. I'd like to hear it discussed more. One of them relating to vacant houses, and the other relating to diversity of occupants. Um, are those hopeless? Are those, are those what? Are, are, are those hopeless problems to try to solve? No, I don't think so. Um, the, the question was about vacant houses and diversity of folks living here. One, one, of, one of the changes I think is going to come up is that um, there are many, many places throughout the state which have adopted um, um, in law um, uh, uses for zoning, uh, where it is, there can be a second smaller unit on a lot. At the moment, that's not allowed in Sonoma or by the Sea Ranch. Uh, if Sonoma changes that law, which it may, uh, then it's going to be up to the Sea Ranch to figure out how to uh, take advantage of that. Um, uh, and that would be one of the ways, is that part of the property could be occupied. Another thing that will change that is that I think, given the web and given the way society is working, there will be an increase in permanent residence here, I'm quite certain. And that will, of course, uh, change that. Um, if people um, um, were more open, and it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient, surely, to rent. And it's inconvenient to have your things disposed to somebody but um, if we could all make more opportunity to share our places with other people, that would be a way of getting greater use out of them. Uh, 
Uh, there is um, uh, one lot on the Thiratch, um, uh, which is uh, actually up for sale now, which could have multiple units on it, which would be some place where really important instruction or a uh, demonstration example of something else could happen. And I hope that will actually come to pass there, because that would be very, very interesting. Um, yeah. Don, are you talking about the transfer site? Yes. I, I thought there was some ambiguity about what could or couldn't be done. Well, there is ambiguity about what can or cannot be done, but I'm certain that uh, I, I thought it was actually already zoned for um, multiple, but I'm told it's not true. Uh, but on the other hand, I uh, believe there also have have been uh, have been things explored about it being multiple, and there have, uh, well, there's ambiguity about what happened with those, okay? Uh, but it's a big site and it should have multiple use and it should be able to be at something that demonstrates uh, uh, new possibilities for us. Um, and then, uh, you know, we all don't, um, we all kind of quiver whenever we uh, come up against the, uh, the fact that um, uh, there's an established plan and that if you wanted to change that plan, you'd actually put the whole thing up in the air. Uh, and, um, uh, and yet, um, uh, making some modifications in the plan of what we can do and taking some lots that uh, are presently single and huge and making them smaller. <coughs> uh, those kinds of things could be interesting uh, and valuable to uh, uh, increase the capacity. Yeah. Uh, there was another part of that question that I didn't answer. That Diversity. Diversity. Diversity of people. Well, that's part of it. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it those are related. Um, I think it's um, but I'm sorry, I do want to interject because I'm afraid I'll lose it otherwise. Okay. One thing which I see as an important aspect of um, getting people to think about this place, um, uh, I would really love to be instrumental in helping it come to be that people would recognize that one of the great achievements of this place is the public access trails. Mm -hmm. That this big stretch of coast has those access trails is a marvelous thing. And yet the story of it is always told, oh, well, the bank bill made us do it. <laughs> uh, well, OK, get over it. There's now this great opportunity that people can, in fact, reach the coast. Yeah. And we ought, to, we ought to make that part of our heritage we're proud of. the next generation of uh, young buyers that are coming into the area uh, that starts to uh, make a statement that I feel uh, is so obviously against what the basic principles of the Sea Ranch uh, uh, were founded on. And that goes to what Mr. Whitaker was, was shocked at, at opening the paper and seeing homes for $3 million, $3 million plus. Why are we continuing to approve uh, estate-sized homes, many mansions, being built on prime uh, bluff property, when that certainly isn't living lightly on the land, and it certainly isn't doing anything interesting architecturally. Uh, all it's doing is driving those prices up, and I think to young people coming into the Sea Ranch is demonstrating that we really aren't committed to these goals that were set forth in the early stages of this fine development. So the question is, the question why, is are why, we, why are many mansions still being approved and constructed on the sea ranch, which goes completely against the principle of living lightly on the land? Why, why are the homes being built large enough to block views, uh, to take over the landscape around them? Um, and even to complete the landscape, the area around them, I would point out a home, a home near me that just was built two years ago. Uh, the landscape is not indigenous. The landscape is not consistent with the environment. And the home is enormous. I think you all heard the question. <laughs> okay. You don't have to repeat it. Yeah, I don't think so. Um, 
Anybody want to take a whack at that one? That's, that's for the design committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got the show. I'll show you that. Is that we're still, right at the moment, we are still abiding by the design manual and the procedures that we have set up over the years. Uh, it's been going, I guess the new system has been going for about 15 years now. Um, there have been, most of the bigger houses actually that are going for these prices were built before that. And they're usually, well, obviously they are prime locations. They have, you know, view of coves or whatever. Um, usually they're spectacular views. And so probably I would, well, I know that the primary reason that those prices are so high is because of the location, not so much the size of the building or the, you know, well, the nature of materials, that materials cost more now than they used to, so that runs the price up a lot. But that isn't, the, the, the houses are not that, are, they're not that big. They're just, people are spending more money on smaller houses, and you can do it these days, and it's not hard. Um, we're, we're, we're working on that, uh, which is not a great thing to say. But the fact is that uh, we've been pretty consistent with not allowing larger buildings to happen. Uh, I know that there's a couple that I can think of that have stuck through, but they are ones that don't look that big, actually, fortunately. But it's a problem, and I think we have to be on our guard, and, I, and we're reviewing some aspects of the design manual uh, right now to deal with that. Uh, it is critical. And it, um, because quite obviously, there are a lot of people around that have a lot of money, and, and you know, spending three million, four million, five million dollars on a piece of the Pacific Ocean front is not a big deal for them. And, uh, and I think it, it, it makes us nervous. I mean, there's no question about it. Because you, you I, I don't know. I, I, it's a very difficult problem. It's not just a problem here, by any means. Uh, but, I mean, I, 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 I think Don is absolutely right. The, the access points that went into place. I had a very close friend, in fact, uh, our closest friends. When the main bill came out and said they were going to do that, and uh, put in access points, and the people here, the owners, got together and voted no. Um, and I was arguing, well, that's absurd, Kathy. I mean, there'll be hordes of people swarming over the sea ranch. <laughs> Kathy, there won't be hordes of people swarming over the sea ranch unless you build a six-lane highway up here from San Francisco. Uh, but anyway, that proved to be not the problem that some people thought it was going to be at all. And that, thank God for that. I mean, I... George? Well, um, I would say uh, don't look to the, to the design committee to resolve all the questions that, resolve, that are, are here at Sea Ranch. The design committee is here to, um, to, to interpret, uh, to um, um, investigate, examine uh, um, people like yourselves who want to build buildings here, um, and, to, and to try to ensure that they follow the principles of the original boundaries in which we've been talking about today. Uh, if you have other motives, which are um, sizes of buildings, etc., etc., that, that are not addressed in the design guidelines uh, um, and are not addressed in the, in the Sonoma um, uh, restrictions, etc., 
And I think you, you have to be, you, you have to have some very good advice on how to approach that. And uh, it, um, I, I personally think we try to be open and clear about what's presented in front of that we have and to look at them without prejudice except for how they conform to the environment and the issues that are discussed in the guidelines. If you, if you get beyond that, I think is a problem that you and the people who, who live here have to address and see how you can deal with that because that will entail a lot of other um, uh, issues, uh, be they uh, legal, and zoning, etc., etc., which are beyond our purview. And so uh, we get our we get in the hot water when we start to talk about things like that because we're not we're not confident in that. I would rather that we if you we can interpret the issues of building on the land, etc., in terms of what it said in the guidelines. But beyond that, that's I think for the people who who appoint us, our, our, our um, um, we're, we are your clients. We're, we're trying to put forth the ideas that you think are important in terms of what this place is about. And beyond that, I think you have to resolve that. I think we have time for one more. I just want to make a <laughs> I have, can take one more question. We've run over our time, but uh, if there's one last question. I don't have a question, but um, people may like to know that there is annually a, a, a public meeting of the board with the design committee. And I think what you're talking about is member input. And you know that is the avenue for me for member input. Um, so there will be an info alert, I'm sure, and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, can I add that, that So in addition to the annual joint meeting of the design committee and the board, if you are interested in talking about what are the features of the Sea Ranch that you want to see preserved into the future. That same afternoon on October 17th, we will have all six members of our design committee here on the ranch, which only happens once a year. They will have, in the morning, they will have a meeting with the board, and in the afternoon, we'll actually be holding a very similar uh, workshop discussion as to the one you're hearing today, although slightly different. Um, whereas the design committee can speak to the features that they feel are important to protect and carry on into the future. And we'd also like to hear from the community what is important to you. Lisa, so, do you have a time on that yet? We don't yet. It's going to be in the afternoon. We haven't quite figured out the time frames for both the morning and the afternoon sections. But the meeting with the board will be in the morning, probably 9, 10-ish range. And in the afternoon will be 1, 2, or at the latest 3 o'clock. But there will be several info alerts coming out about that. Okay, I think with that we're going to bring this to a close and thank our speakers one more time. <laughs>